just what is a data model and why is it important? Um, let's see here. So let me just uh, jump right in. Let's see here. No, I just have to figure out how to get this thing going here. There we go. So, um, you know, I just want to, uh, maybe it's a little bit humorous, but, uh, you know, get everybody's uh, mind thinking the right way. So if you're anything like me and you've been working software for, for quite a while, you're probably over here where um, when you're communicating, you know, putting messages together, you're you're thinking more in terms of, of data structures. Okay, how am I going to organize the data in an efficient way to communicate it and store it? And, you know, the different concerns that we have in terms of um, space and time and those kinds of things. So, and we've been living over here for, for quite a while. So data modeling isn't exactly that, all right? There is an aspect to it, and at some point we do need to communicate data and need to be concerned with those things, but a lot of what data modeling is is uh, is describing the the things that you want to communicate about and how they relate to one another. So really that's what we're getting at over here. It's, it's going to require a little bit of a different way of thinking, at least to describe that. So anyway, uh, moving on from from uh, that aspect here, what is uh, data architecture? So uh, let's see, I'll, I'll go with, start with a textbook definition. And what we're trying to accomplish is just to describe the data uh, going into or out of a unit of portability, so your face, your face component that uh, wants to communicate in the context of the entities of concern to the UOP uh, to enable an integrator to combine UOPs together to you know, provide a larger capability to have a system. So that's all fairly uh, complicated technical speak. So I have the simple English version here. Um, you know, our intent is to um, define common terminology so that when we describe communicated data, we know what we're talking about. So it's, it's, we, try, we try to keep it as, as straightforward as that. One way I like to think about this, I like to liken some of this back to uh, a dictionary, okay? Um, the dictionary, uh, super the English language, you know, allows us to define certain common words, and then we can um, have a common understanding of what those words mean, and we can combine them in different ways to make sentences and talk to one another. I'd say, uh, you know, a lot of what we're trying to accomplish, the why in data modeling, is to do the same thing. We have terminology in our domains um, that we um, that we use when we talk to each other. How do we um, sort of lay that out in a, in a more formal way so that when we build messages and tie the data in our messages back to that, we know what we're talking about? I'd say today we find ourselves in a, in a situation, I mean, pre-face, where, um, you know, we just build messages and count on, you know, the name of the field in the message providing, you know, all the information everybody needs to know. But, you know, if you've done any work on a, on a rather significant program, you know that that's not always the case. Sometimes, you know, names are terse or um, the author thinks it completely describes uh, what's necessary, but uh, it's not always obvious to the reader. And part of the why on data modeling is to provide that background so you've got more clarity uh, on what the data being communicated is. Um, one thing that I think is important to point out is that data model mechanisms are tended to be domain independent. So FACE doesn't do anything to say that, oh, this is data modeling for mission systems, or this is data uh, modeling for communication or flight systems. You know, practically speaking, you could model just about, you know, any, uh, any concepts, you know, that you can imagine using FACE data modeling. So it's, you know, it's pretty flexible. Really, you know, what you're, um, you know, what you're going to build is something that defines, you know, the language, you know, in the domain that you're going to work in. So let's see here. Next chart, a um, little bit of a um, little bit of the what on the data architecture. So there's there's a number of pieces here. Uh, of course, you have the technical standard, which includes what we call the meta model, um, and that's really you know the, the the nuts and bolts of the construction you know of a of a data model. The meta model is sort of the rules on the the kinds of things that can be in a model, and how they can tie into one another, and some additional uh, constraints to some, think of these as extra rules to, to add on top. Similar to any kind of programming language, um, I'd say the, the meta model sort of represents a syntax, and the OCL constraints um, are like the semantic rules. Uh, you know, programming language, there might be a semantic rule that says, you know, I've got two variables that I'm going to compare against one another, and the semantic rule says they have to be of the same type, right? The same, same kind of idea here. 
So, you know, that's where the definition of the, the, um, the data architecture language uh, lives. You know, there's a couple of other uh, things here that are um, important to understand. Uh, the consortium publishes something called a shared data model. Now, this um, model uh, has in it uh, some of the, the real fundamental building blocks that everybody um, will start with, all right? And, you know, if I'm going to continue my dictionary analogy in English words, the shared data model is almost like your alphabet, okay? It defines these real basic building blocks that you, that you can then use to come up with um, more um, uh, more comprehensive uh, kinds of things. I have another chart that talks a little bit about some of the things that are in there, so I'm not going to spend uh, too much time. Um, there are other kinds of models beyond the shared data model. Oh, let me back up for a second. One, one other thing, the shared data model is actually managed by the consortium with a governance plan. So, um, you know, you can't just make changes to it, right? There has, it has to go through a change process. We've got a subcommittee in the, the data uh, architecture uh, working group that uh, works those changes and publishes the shared data model out at regular intervals. So your UOP will have to be conformant to it and use things in it. Um, and if you if there's something missing um, ahead of conformance, you're going to need to work through the PRCR process to make those changes back into shared data model. Now, down below, you see uh, other, other kinds of models here. We've got a... Um, domain-specific data model, a UOP-supplied model, and an integration model. So the, um, if you're building a UOP, um, the UOP-supplied model is a required artifact. All right? It is going to define your interfaces to your unit of portability and, and some other items as well. An optional item here is a domain-specific data model. So the idea here being, um, Often there's a community of interest that wants to share certain common terminology and definitions. So a lot of that can be captured in this domain-specific model uh, and then reused uh, across uh, a number of UOP supplied models. So for instance, if um, a group wanted to get together and have a, say, a navigation-based domain-specific data model that defines things like waypoints and um, flight legs and horizontal protection levels and those kinds of things, that could all be done in a domain-specific data model, and then anybody that creates a UOP uh, could use that, and you would have an agreed-to, you know, base set of vocabulary, that's like a little dictionary, um, that you could use then to design your interfaces in your UOP model. Um, as I mentioned, the UOP model, you know, is, uh, is built by developers of a UOP. You know, it's going to extend either the shared data model or the domain-specific data model or both um, with things that uh, are not contained there um, so that everything to be able to use your UOP um, resides uh, in that model. And finally, there's uh, an introduced in phase 3.0, there's something called an integration model. This is not required. Um, uh, but it does define um, ways to describe the connectivity um, between UOPs and some of the key elements of transport services like transformations and aggregations, you know, data marshaling and unmarshaling and those kinds of things um, can be described with an integration model. Okay. Um, let's see. There's a lot of detail on this chart, and I'm not going to get into all of it, um, but this is, you know, maybe a, a good... Uh, starting point for you. I will say that um, what you see on this chart is not everything that's in the face meta model. It is um, uh, it's designed to give you a flavor of the kinds of things. But, um, but what, what I'd like you to take away is that uh, a face data model is actually three, three main levels, um, the conceptual, the logical, and the platform level. As the name implies, you know, the conceptual level. Um, we, you know, it's where the big ideas live, right? Where you, where you invent terminology. If we were going to invent the idea of a waypoint, you know, it would live in the conceptual model. Okay, at this level, you've got, you know, entities. So maybe a waypoint um, is an entity. You can think about it that way. There's also associations. There may be relationships between entities. So if I had, a, continuing my navigation example, I had a, a waypoint entity and an aircraft entity. I might have a flying to relationship between the aircraft and a waypoint entity. And just, so again, just trying to give you a, a flavor of these things. Um, another key idea are these observable properties. Entities can have properties. So like my waypoint example, a property of a waypoint might be its position. 
okay? Um, my flying to association between a waypoint and an aircraft might have a property of time to go, right? So there's a time property to it. Um, these observable properties are all things that are defined in the shared data model. Okay, you can't invent new ones, um, not without going through the, the process. Everything to the left of this line is things that are in the shared data model and standardized across um, uh, all, uh, all UOPs for a particular version of FACE. Things to the right of the arrow are things that you can define in, you know, UOP models or domain models or integration models and so on. Now, beyond the conceptual level, there's a, a logical model, all right? So it takes everything in the conceptual level with the intent being uh, to provide some more detail about, you know, how we're going to describe some of those properties. So I talked about a position property, right? Now, at the conceptual level, it's just position, and we all understand that, right? But, you know, to communicate about it, we need something more detailed, like how are you going to give me that position? Is it going to be WGS84 or Earth Centered or Earth Fixed or whatever, right? So that's where some of this gets filled in. We talked about how these properties are measured. And we try to keep it fairly high level. We don't get into the data types and things like that. It's, um, but notionally, you know, try to tie it back to, to systems of measure. That's the main uh, aspect of the logical model is to refine what's here and fill in some of these details, make it a little more specific. And finally, this platform model takes it one step further and actually fills in some of the data types. So, you know, using my waypoint example, I may say I've got a waypoint and a position, which has a position. I've got a waypoint, and that position is going to be measured using, you know, WGS84, you know, that long altitude kinds of measurements. And down here, I've got a waypoint. Um, it's got a position, and it's WGS84, and I'm going to realize the, uh, the latitude and longitude with doubles and the altitude with an int, okay? So I'll give you an idea on how this stuff uh, all flows. I'm, I know I'm going super fast for you guys, but hopefully uh, the message is... Is coming through. And finally, while it's not technically a level, um, there is a thing called a UOP model within the face data architecture, um, which allows you actually to, to identify a component and uh, describe the data that comes into and out of it. All right, so I can have my portable component or my platform specific component, which has some number of ports. Um, and each of those ports, you know, uh, uses a view element from the platform model to describe what the, the data is. And it all, it all ties back to your entities and associations. Let's see, how am I doing on time? Um, let's see. You know, one thing I didn't probably pay enough attention to here are views. You know, I described entities and associations, but views are how you actually um, describe how are you going to take data from those entities and associations and package it up on an interface? So, you know, going back to that first slide, you know, where I talked about data structures versus data modeling, you know, the entities and associations are more the, the data modeling, you know, the abstract side of things, where views are the packaging and, and how you're going to uh, manage the content of your interface and how, how is each message going to be organized and those kinds of things. That's where the data structures aspect comes in. Finally, finally right here. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Let's check the next chart here. So, let's see. I got a five minutes left. All right. Um, I thought it might be good to uh, go through a little bit of an example that I that I hope most of us can relate to, uh, based on uh, a university. So I've been, you know, using my little waypoint example. This is a little more filled out here. Um, the notation I'm using, um, basically these uh, rounded rectangles are entities and these hexag hexagonal items are uh, relationships. And this is purely, you know, the, the conceptual level. That's all I'm really going to address here. But again, just to give you a flavor of what kinds of stuff um, you have to uh, do and, and put into uh, a data model. So when we talk about a university, some common, you know, terms that we're going to, you know, bring up. You know, we've got, well, the university itself, right? There's courses, there's classes, there's rooms, all right? There's teachers, there's students. So how do we capture that all here? So, um, you know, the, those, those noun kinds of items, you know, the university, the course, and those kinds of things, you know, an easy way to think about it is, you know, you can, you can look at those being entities. So the university itself is an entity. 
and that uh, university, well, it's got a location. We haven't talked about how we how we specify it, but you know, universities all have a location, right? You now there's courses, and the course may have an ID, right? Course code, something like that, a duration. You know, uh, maybe it's uh, three credit hours or something like that. It's got a name, something that's uh, that's uh, you know a little more human readable. Okay, now a course, you know, by itself, you know, doesn't really isn't that really meaningful. It's got to be offered by a university, right? So there's a relationship between the university and the course, and that the course offers that university. Now you see, I've got some little numbers on some of these things here. Right, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what, you know, what the, some of these labels mean. This course offering, you know, relationship. Well, on one side of it, there's a there's a university, and the other side is the course that's being offered. Now, since there's no numbers over here, it's assumed that each course offering, you know, is part of one university and relates to one course. All right, so if there's no number there, it means one. Now, the one to many on this side says, well, a university can play in many one one or more you know course offering relationships it basically says you know that university can offer you know one or more courses that's that's essentially what we're we're saying here um you know paying attention to another part of the model here um you've got courses which are like things in the catalog but you know back in the day when i was in school um you know, there was often in a semester, you know, numerous numerous offerings of that one particular course, all right? And there were certain sessions, sections of the class, right? So a class is actually an instance of a course, right? So any given semester, all right, there'd be, you know, a course instance relationships between a course and a class, saying this class is an instance of that course, all right? This course can have one or more instances of it in the semester. All right. Each one of these relationships is, is between one course and one class. Tracking down this way here. Well, who who uh, who takes classes? All right. People take classes. All right. So and people are enrolled in classes. So here's this class enrollment relationship. It says I've got a class. I've got a person. All right. And uh, and there's an enrollment relationship between the two. Now I haven't added anything here to characterize it, but you know I I could put some properties in here if I wanted to further describe that relationship. Um, now you see here on class enrollment, all right, it's between a class and a person, but in this particular case, you know, we've given that person a certain kind of role name, right? They're playing the role of student here, okay? If you look on the other side, all right, you know, a, a class of students isn't really that interesting unless you've got a teacher. So there's also a class teaching relationship between a person and a class. All right, so on one end, we've got the class, and the other end, we've got a person. In this case, we've given them the role name of teacher. Um, so you can kind of see how, you know, hopefully you can see how this ties together. Um, again, looking at our at our cardinalities here, this basically says that um, I can have a person who participates in, you know, zero or more, you know, teaching relationships. They don't have to be teachers. People don't. All right. In a class teaching relationship, I have one class and one teacher. Need that. Okay, and every class has, you know, one will have, will participate in one class teaching relationship. So what I'd like to wrap up with on this chart is, you know, we've we've described all these relationships. These aren't data structures. These are, you know, um, relationships between you know, ideas and terms that we would use if we're talking about university. If Anybody who looks at a, or who understands university could look at this picture and say, yeah, that makes sense. That's, you know, that's, that's what it is, right? We've defined a ubiquitous language for some small slice of universities. But that's not necessarily how we package up the data. So this little sample view here, you know, proposes, um, I might want to have a message that's got the name and ID of all the courses offered by the university. Okay. In phase 3.0, what we've done is we've we've adopted a uh, an SQL like syntax um, that uh, that can be applied to talk to, to allow us to describe the data that's being extracted from our uh, entity model. So here I'm going to say select course ID and course name. As I said I want the name and the ID of all courses, right? From a university, I've given this. If you're familiar with SQL, I've just given it an alias called U, so I can save myself a little typing. I'm going to join you 
university on this university um, line to car course offering. So course offering, you know, this line, this line is labeled university. So I joined it from the university to course offering. And from course offering on course to course, so I get from here all the way over to here, all right? And, I've, and again, I selected the name and the ID, and this will, this describes uh, a view that contains, you know, all of the course IDs, right, and names of all the, co all the courses, part of the course offering relationship with the university. You know, what I haven't described here is how we package that up, but that'll be a little, little deep to get into for this this quick session today but there's a there's a templating mechanism that allows me to take this data now and format it into a message that's uh, that's the data structure I might want to communicate so let's see that's the uh, the last slide I planned on going over um, and I think schedule wise we're just over 20 minutes um, well, so what's the next time and do I that's great, Bill. Thank you for that. Uh, Judy, do you want to say a quick word? Sure. Um, for, my name is Judy Serenzia. I'm from the Open Group. I'm the FACE Consortium Program Director. And I do want to thank our presenter, Bill Kinahan. Uh, he's uh, chair of the Data Architecture Working Group within the FACE Consortium, uh, works for Sikorsky Aircraft, so deeply entrenched in the uh, avionics software development that we focus on. I also want to thank all of our attendees today for joining. Uh, hopefully you learned a little bit more about the, uh, the FACE data architecture and uh, some details from Bill's examples on uh, how to construct uh, data architecture or data model concepts. Uh, we, if you need any more information about the FACE Consortium, uh, you can check us out at www.opengroup.org, O-R-G slash FACE. And if you have any particular questions about today's webinar or uh, just want to get additional information that's not available on our website, you can contact us via email at ogface-admin at opengroup.us. I thank you again for joining us. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.